All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a pretty cool one we got for y'all tonight. I am joined by Mr. Heath Hyatt. If anybody has listened to the Journey podcast, it is part of the Houndsman XP empire right now. And uh, he does an excellent job on bringing a lot of good information. He's also a uh, native of Virginia here. And uh, in this episode, we get to talk a lot of the different styles of hunting that we do. I think that's one of the great things about doing these podcasts is you get to really meet and explore different forms of hound hunting and different perspectives in different ways that other people do things. We kind of talk about that and how they do things on in his neck of the woods versus over here in our neck of the woods. And then we kind of get into the bread and butter of the uh, fight going on here in Virginia, which we are going in the right direction. If you listen to the Monday highlights episode or have seen what the Virginia Hound Dog Alliance, Hunting Dog Alliance, excuse me, has uh, been posting here a lot lately. So, Y'all be sure to uh, keep up with this one, and uh, I hope y'all enjoyed it near as much as I did uh, recording it. So, all right, let's get it going, guys. Welcome, everybody, to the Hound's Tales podcast. This is your home for field trialing and deer dog hunting. It'll be stories and discussions on the world of dog hunting. So let's drop the gate cast your hounds and get ready for another episode of the Hounds Tales podcast. All right, we are crossing lines today, but we're staying in Virginia. Um, he's kind of in the, the middle part of the state where I'm in the southwestern part of the state. And I actually, uh, drive through your area a lot oh god i'm sorry <laughs> when, I, when i travel down east you know i come through appomattox okay i um, got you and that's where you're at right yeah that's right that's right yeah, that's right that's what i thought yeah, yeah. yeah so i come through appomattox um and uh when i go down to bb's or down to doug's and hunt i'm through there quite a bit in fact i'm kind of aggravated i wanted to go to bb's this week and actually get my pups get the pups out and work them down there this weekend but due to scheduling and daughter's activities she's keeping me she's keeping me bowed up with this volleyball but <laughs> Them sports uh, you know, will do it. <laughs> yeah travel travel ball like holy cow uh, but no we're gonna talk today um james and i uh we started um, chatting over um messenger on facebook because we have a common interest um and and what's going on with the legislation we got to talking back and forth about it, and we're going to bring up some perspectives that we have that we think that that everybody should either even realize or um, need to be better at. And then we're just going to talk dogs because that's what we're about is talking dogs. But James runs the Hounds Tale, so they like to tell stories about them old hounds, and I think they're going to get some good stuff coming in. But uh, you know, their 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 mission on in, on his podcast is to promote a positive um view of hound hunting that's right. and uh, us as hunters that's what we should be doing that's that's what we should be doing as a whole as a group and that's kind of what got james and i um together um talking yeah. so anyway we're glad to have you on james tell a little tell my listeners um a little bit about you what you do and then we just roll from there yeah man yeah man i appreciate you having me it's definitely an honor um so uh, I'm, my name's James Hudson. Like he said, I'm from central Virginia, you know, right here smack dab in the middle of it. Um, and I am mostly a field trial. Uh, we run the Fox pens and, um, and coyote pens. If we do travel down South, you know, once we get out of the state, um, uh, but, uh, uh, between that and deer dog hunting, that's kind of my, that's kind of my niche. That's kind of where I stick. And, uh, that's where the Hounds Tales podcast, um, that's where we kind of center our focus at. But, um, but like you said, you know, the, the main goal about it is, yeah, we want to tell stories. We want to talk dogs. I mean, that's what, that's what we're here for. That's what we want to listen to. But promoting that positive aspect at the end of everything is really what, what it's all about. You know, I try to end a lot of my episodes on what do we got to do as houndsmen? You know, all my guests, that's one of the biggest things I asked in, in the end of it is, what do we got to do as houndsmen to keep this sport alive? What do we have to do? You know, what is your opinion? What is their opinion, you know, on what we can improve on, what we can do better to make 
it to where we can both, me and you both can, can pass it down to our kids and let them enjoy it. You know, so that's that's kind of where uh, that's where my podcast and that's what I do is, you know, I, I hunt hard and, and talk about it when I'm not hunting hard. So <laughs> it's I mean, it's a way of life. That's right. It I is. just sit down and talk dogs all day long. And then I realize how much I don't know about dogs. Every time I do it, I'm like, yeah, man, I you know, I, I didn't know that. Or, I, you know, that's something else I can learn and, and do. So, well, and that's the I mean, dog. You know, that's the bonus about doing this crossover thing, too. And I, I love this idea because I listen to y'all's podcast, the Houndsman XP. And, you know, I listen to a, a lot of these other ones, the Hunting Dog Public. You know, there's a lot of good dog hunting podcasts out there that I listen to. And I learn so much more. And you don't really realize until you listen to it how much you can pick up off of these other podcasts and these other like training methods and other ways of doing things for different dogs. Like you can really pick up a lot off of it. You know, and I, we're kind of repeating what we repeat, what we repeat, because this is, um, I had Doug on here a week or so ago, and Doug said the same thing. Like, if you have an open mind and you will listen to other people, you will gain some type of knowledge. Now, whether you want to accept that knowledge or not, that's up to you. But there, and I, t- I tell this in every class I teach, I teach a lot. Um, for the academy that, uh, you know, for our department, I, I teach a lot of classes. I do a lot of schools for canine. And I tell people every time that if you look around this room, there's 20 people in this room and you look around this room, everybody in this room knows something you don't. Mm-hmm. Yep. And if you'll be humble enough to accept that and use it as a benefit instead of a, a ego trip, um, you know, I'm up here teaching and I will say, that if you don't know what you're talking about, people can pick you pick pick you apart really quick. They know if you're full of crap or not. A hundred percent. And but there's always something to learn, and there's always value in it. Um, and like I said, I, I I preach it. I say it. Everybody, some everybody around you knows something you don't. Yep. Yep. And you know, I did an episode with a, a buddy of mine um, in the field trial world, John Monar, and he, I think he said it best. You know, he, the way he described it was. I don't care if they're 15 years old or 95 years old. There's going to be something that they do when we go to a field trial, go to a competition that I like to walk around. Like, And he said that. He said, I like to walk around and watch what these guys are doing with their dogs to, to prep them for the hunt. To, uh, to, you know, to, you know, do self care after the first day or, or after the second day of field trial. And, you know, it's, there's so much you can just observe. And if you ask questions, most houndsmen, are not going to be like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, uh, you know, go on somewhere. I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. Most houndsmen, if you ask them, I don't care if you are competing with each other, you know, they're going to tell you. And you mm-hmm. can learn if you just sit there and absorb it. And it's your, it's your judgment call as a houndsman to, you know, use it, don't use it. Yes, I like that. Yeah, no, I think that's stupid. But if you, like you said, if you take the time to just sit there and listen and ask questions, man, you can learn so much off of so many different people. And there's going to come a time if you stay, if, if, if dog, if dog life is your life, hounds, hunting, whatever it is, dog life, your life, there's going to come a time that you can, you can pull that out of the, the tool shed and use it. I can promise you that because every dog's different, every situation different, every training scenario is different everything is nothing is the only the only thing that is constant in life is change yep Yep. and you know i like i said you can the more you the bigger your toolbox the better the trainer handler houndsman you're going to be right 100 percent, 100 percent. and you can listen to like you said you know you know speaking on that you know you said change is big but then there's things that you can take from like if you listen to these guys that were hunting dogs back in the 90s and how the dogs have changed and how the ways of hunting have changed yeah there's a lot of things that don't work that they did but there's still going to be those little tricks and there's little traits that they can you know they, that dog's doing that that's what that's what makes a dog right there or I can do this with this dog and make him you know heal faster or what you know whatever something like that you know those old heads man they they know some tricks and you can still even though it is changing you can still take those things and adapt them to the change 
So I mean, that's I, I don't know. It's just uh, it's that's one of the most beautiful things about this sport. Even though it is changing, that you can still learn from the past mm-hmm. too. You know, I, and I, I, it's funny you bring up the past because I was thinking about this. Um, I had a long conversation about some Garmin technology here mm, Sunday mm-hmm. last weekend, and um, we were talking about the the Garmin's and technology and stuff. And we were, we went back to talking about the the old beat beat collars, and I mean. First two dogs I had, I didn't even have a collar. I just turned them loose and chased them as hard as I could go. That's you know? it. That's it. That didn't work out too well. But um, but anyway, I, you know, I got to thinking about this. I was driving down the road, and and I got to thinking about technology because I fish a lot too. Um, I love to fish. Um, I stay on the water, but I don't have I don't have the the scope, the Garmin scope, the live scope, and I don't have a fish finder. I do have a fish finder, but I use it for depth and temperature. That's it. Right. Um, but I, you just talk about technology because I'm talking about the past. Yeah. I feel like the old timers and, you know, I think one of the things that has helped me as a hunter is I didn't have that technology. You had, you had to learn the woods. You had to learn where the game traveled, where they ate, where they fed at, mm-hmm. um, where the food supply was, um, where they were bedding. And you had to get into those areas. Of course, again, the population back in the, the early 90s were nowhere near what it is today. And and I think about technology as a whole, how it's made us lazy and how it has taken away some of that knowledge that the, the old timers that taught me and you, um, that how it took it's taken away from that. Um and I, I feel like it's a great tool. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, I like being able to know that my dog's going to cross right there in that curve on that hard top so I can be sitting there to pick him up. Right. Absolutely. But I also know that, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, Garmin's, I started using the GPS system in 13, 2013, so it's been 11 years. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to, you know, 08, 7, 8, 9. Let's go back to those years. And you had the old beep beep collar. You had to pull over, stop, and listen. Yep, here he comes. You had to pull over, stop, and listen. Yep, here he comes. And you were guessing exactly. What, sometimes you guessed right, and you would be standing pretty close. And sometimes they'd cross 100, 200, 300 yards above you, and, you know, it was gone. Right. And today with technology, I think we're always sitting there waiting in the exact same spot, which, again, I feel like it's made us lazy. Oh man, I could I could do a whole episode on this, man. <laughs> I really could. Um, I, I, so I come, like I said, I, I come from a deer dog, you know, background. I didn't start competition field trialing until I think twenty twenty, so twenty nine, you know, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. So my most of my experience, I grew up deer dog hunting, and I did not pick up a GPS unit until I didn't pick up a beep beep collar until twenty twenty. That's just how I was raised. We used ears, and we knew the lay of the land. I'm lucky Mm -hmm. enough to be raised like that, but I'm also lucky enough to be where I grew up was right in the middle of our hunting land, like right in the middle of all our our blocks. So it wasn't Mm -hmm. nothing for us to go and say, hey, the dogs need to be trained to go flip the latch and on the gate and let them go. And they go across the road and go in and start hunting, you know, and then you listen, you listen, you listen, and and it's and this is an old school way of doing it and those dogs would come home but like you you know kind of talking about you know the the gps and the technology that's one of the big things um and it and it drives me nuts um when when i'm when i'm deer dog hunting i don't i don't you i don't watch the gps unless like you said we're close to a road if we're close to a road, I'll watch it and kind of really make sure either A, I can get in front of them, or, or B, if they're going to come out of that hard road, I can catch them. But if we're in the block, I don't use it. It, stays, it, it sits in the truck. It sits in the truck. I listen. And mm-hmm. I, I grew up walking dogs. I, I grew up walking the dogs into the woods, hiking them in there, you know, I know there's all the blocks that we hunt. I know how many bottoms are between this road and that road, and I can listen to the dogs and tell you in which path they are, which direction they're going, and how they're going to come out down the road. That's 
and my dad's the same way. My dad was like that. My I mean, still like that. My grandpa was like that before he passed away. That's how they were. My grandpa was deaf as all get out, but he could hear a dog three miles away and then pinpoint him exactly. Um, but on the deer dog hunting end, I think that's where the crutch has been with the technology. And like you said, the technology is a beautiful thing. I would never give it up for anything. I love it. But I don't know how I hunted without it. <laughs> right. Like, you know, you, you have it and you're like, gosh, how did I get by without it? Yeah. 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 I mean, the fact that you can go out and do whatever you need to do and your dogs are a hundred percent coming home safe almost every, not a hundred percent, but 95% of the time they're coming home safe every time. As long as the GPS keeps in connection and doesn't fail, you know, as long as the collar stays on, they're coming home. They're hundred yeah. percent. If the dog home. doesn't come home, it's because I was too lazy to get out of my truck and go get it. That's it. And I can I can't tell you the nights that I slept in the cab of my truck trying to keep up with dogs and 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 I didn't want to leave them in the woods like I didn't want to leave them because maybe the area we were at you know if they dropped off in a road and it wasn't safe and man I mean it's it was nights after <laughs> lots of nights and I right. don't I don't you don't leave them, I don't I don't have to leave them in the woods anymore right Right. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. But then again, like you said, you know, it's also a curse because a lot of these younger guys, uh, I, I, I don't know how to say this without sounding degrading to the younger generation, but a lot of the younger guys that are getting into this sport are too busy sitting here doing like this, looking at their palm in, in the GPS box and trying to watch and judge a dog off of that. You can't judge a dog off of that. Mm -hmm. You got to get out and look, man. You got to really get out and study that dog. Watch what he's doing. Watch if he's holding the track. You know, I'm sure in y'all's cases, you know, see if he's staying on that tree or 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 see if you know see if he's actually hunting the track up. You know, I don't I don't know a lot about the bear hunting side, but man, it's like if you're going to use that GPS to judge a dog, you're not going you're not going to be a houndsman. That's just it. That's no, just the, that's just the God's honest truth about it. I will tell you one thing though, that it was a kind of a, a shocker to me, and I'll, I'll give y'all I'll give you a quick story. Mm -hmm. So when I first got the GPS, um, I, I had a, a a ragtag pack of dogs. Um, I had two two really good dogs, and then I had some young dogs coming on. And with the beep beeps, you know, you you turn the dogs loose, you turn it on, yeah, beep beep beep, everybody's in the same direction. You know, an hour later, two hours later, they end up treed, mm. and you you know you walk half mile, mile, however far, two miles into the tree, and everybody's there. Well, like I said, lesson learned here. I had a dog that was never all never stayed in the race, and she always ended up the tree before I got there, and I didn't know that until I got the Garmin. No, kidding. and I'm like, well, I just learned something right there. Right. You know that that was for me. Like I said, she was always falling out. She would make loops and do her thing. And then before I'd get to the tree, she, and this didn't happen once. This happened every race. Hmm. And I would have never known it without the Garmin. Right. Like you talking about your dogs holding the line. I, I, I would have never known it. Yeah. The Garmin told on her. Yeah. I mean, it told on her. Yeah. 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 I did a, if, yeah. I did an episode with Billy Gray uh, from Outdoor Dogs of Blind. He told a story <laughs> like that, man. It, he said, you know, I forget my, all the words, but he's like, this dog, I thought he was out there burning something up for three hours. And he's like, and that dog was sitting on an island waiting for it. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't doing anything. Yeah. And without that GPS, mm -hmm. he never would have known it, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's right. So, I mean, it's kind of like a, a two-edged sword. Like right. I said, it's it's gotten us it's gotten us as hunters a little lazy, especially the, the people that didn't that haven't uh, grew up without it, for sure. And then you know the ones that did grow up without it, I, I believe we have a um, a knowledge base that puts us a little bit ahead because of we had to go out and hunt. Like you had to go out, like you said, and bust a brush and learn. You had to learn the animal. You had to learn the land. You know, you you had you had to learn everything, right? And right. I just don't I don't think you know I don't think we are that society anymore. No, and, and you know anybody that is getting into this sport, or even if you're you know you're in it and you're still kind of learning kind of thing, like we talked about, you can always learn something. But it, my advice is always, I mean, I know it kind of sucks, I know it's a lot of work, but if you're out there training or pleasure running, get out of the truck, man. Go out there and be with them, you know. 
I know a lot, not everybody, you know, hikes dogs. I'm old school when it comes to my deer dogs, man. It's I'm, I'm hiking them. The, I, I got commands that I collar out and it keeps them close so I can control where they're going. And that's how I get them in certain mm-hmm. blocks, you know? Mm-hmm. So I highly advise, and even if you just go out there and walk the woods, man, you learn so much on how a dog's going to run by walking those mm-hmm. bottoms like you can look at a gps and say oh well yeah they're taking a beeline straight this way but i know because i've walked it that there's a bottom between there and that road and they're going to hit that bottom and take a hard right and they're actually going to go up above where you think they're coming yep yeah knowing those little benches and knowing those those um little uh hidden holler like yeah mm-hmm. i mean absolutely yep. um Yes, but again, that's from from getting out and, and doing. And like I said, your the lay of your land's a little different now, but right. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, and you know something else too, and I'm, I'm sure this is kind of a roll into it. You know, it's I think that the GPS is also going to be what saves our sport. I'm I'm a firm it, believer in that. Yeah, and I need to apologize to any of you you deer doggers that heard my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and that's what James is like. Hey, man. Like, yeah. So, just to clarify, I said that you know I see a lot of deer dogs without collars, uh, tracking collars, and let me just clarify that. The I haven't seen it in person because I've been very few times, and I will say that I was down at Chipokes. Um, back in December, early December, and hunted with uh, the Clements, uh, Whitney and her dad. And they had uh, two or three truckloads of dogs, and the, every dog had a collar on them. So that was my personal experience. But you see a lot of posts. We talk about social media. You see a lot of posts with dogs, you know, a, 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 you know, 20, 30 dogs running around, and none of them have collars on them. And that was my perception. So you know, perception is reality. That's what you think. Um, but in my real life experience, the only time I've been, like I said, every dog had a collar on it. And James was like, yeah, we all run. And I was like, oh, sorry. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Just forgive me. I wasn't talking out of um, ir- ignorance or anything. Like I said, when you, you see stuff on Facebook all the time, and we know the Facebook, I call it fake book because it's never right. half the time. It's never right. But, um, you know, you see a lot of posts with with dogs running without collars and that's what just kept going through my head so right my apologies <laughs> <Guys>. <laughs> well and you got to think too you know um uh, like my dad's dogs like a lot of times you know if he if he gets them back from after pleasure running he, you know he'll you know we don't have a leash law you know it's open fence law in virginia and they're like pets to us i mean what do you do with your normal you know your normal yard dog you just let them out you let them stay. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, you know, during the weekends, he just lets them chill out in the yard. Now, if they get a wild hair and they want to go run again, they go run again. And I think that may be sometimes where that confusion hits or, um, you know, jailbreaks. Jailbreaks happen all the time. Yeah. You know, and I think that's probably 95% of what those posts that are on Facebook are probably jailbreaks. You know, the innocent mm-hmm. ones at least. You know, yeah. a lot of those guys, and a lot of those times they're just they're just jailbreaks where dogs got out. I mean, hell, we ha- we had it last week. We had uh, my my running partner. Um, we were getting ready to go pleasure running. And his daughter walked up to the lot and said, "I helped Daddy," and flipped the latch, and out the door mm. they went. <laughs> <Thank God. laughs> out the door Thank they God. went. So I mean, you know, there, there's so many. Like you said, it's perception, but there's so many situations that. Um, yeah. And you don't know what context or what the backstory is. That's the pro. That's another problem with fa- with fa- Facebook. You right. don't know, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so. any and, the, and that's you know and anybody can go on there and write anything, mm-hmm. anything. That's right. There's no oath behind it. Nobody's nobody's word is anything no more. You know, you can go on there and said the grass is blue and the sky is purple, and everybody, oh my God, he really saw that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a fact. So, James, what kind of do- I mean, so what what kind of dogs you run, and what I mean, um, you got a mixture. You running a certain breed, or you got different dogs for different. I know you said you run fox and deer. Yes. So I, I I'm one of the few that have. Well, I say the few. There's probably more out there than I know, but I have a deer pack and I have a field trial pack. You know, some of my field trial dogs will run deer, but their main purpose and what I have them for is to field trial the competition, fox pens, 
you know, coyote mm-hmm. pens, that's what they're for. Um, and those are American foxhounds. Those are fully registered, you know, by the book, pedigree, all that kind of stuff of foxhounds. Um, mm-hmm. But, now, and they're walker, you know, they're walker foxhounds. I don't really mess with the right. Julys. I don't go to the trig and the, and, and the that. Um, you know, there's there's a little off-kilter style, but, you know, mostly July and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm a walker guy. Um, now, my deer dogs, they are... I couldn't tell you. They're a mixed up bunch of stuff. I know there's not a beagle, and uh, beagle guys don't kill me. I don't like nothing short, and I like to run. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. But well, that was going to be one of my questions: is like, um, do do you do you like your dogs to like flat out scald them, or do you like to just to push them through blocks where they're they can get a shot. So, my, and that's why I like the, where my deer dogs are at right now. Um, like I said, they're a mixed up bunch of stuff, but there's a little bit of foxhound in them. There is tree and walker. I mean, there's coon stock. You know, there's that kind of, you know, um, there's red tick. You know, and there's a big mixture. Like, they come out all kinds of different, you know, patterns and colors, you know. I've had dogs that are almost solid white with a little, with a bunch of blue tick in them, and it's from the same litter, and it's it looks like a a tree and walker in the next you know puppy, you know there's it's just a big mix, but there those dogs are slow enough to really break down and hunt, and but if they get up on it, they're fast enough to stay with it and drive it out of the block. Um, me personally, and. It, and this is where that it, the adaptive, um, it, it, if I was a millionaire, I'd have a pack of beagles. I'll put it to you that way. And the reason I say mm-hmm. that is there's different blocks. Um, there's smaller, there's smaller blocks that we have that are really thick that have a bunch of roads in them. If you could take a pack of beagles in there and not blow out of the block in the first 10 minutes of the chase, that's great. Let them deer bounce around in front of that beagle. The beagle's going to hold on to it. They're they're perfect for that. I, I will never take that away from a beagle. But we also have blocks that are a thousand, two thousand acres, and I'm trying to see how fast I can drive that government goat from one end to the other. You know, that's just the way I like it. I love pushing a deer. I love pushing it. That's just my preference when it comes to a deer. I like seeing it. I don't want to. When I when if I shoot a deer, I want the dogs to be close. I want the, mm-hmm. I want to pull the trigger, see the deer drop, and turn my head to the left, and there's the dogs. I, I'm not one that's you know okay. But here come here come the dogs. You know, a few minutes later, that's great. You know, it's per, personal preference there. But for me, mm-hmm. that's why I like the Walker, the long legged dogs is is for that reason. Right. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, the the one experience I had. The dogs were a little bit further behind than that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, not far, but I'd done enough video. I'm like, the, I'd see the deer, the deer would come through, and within a minute, I mean, you're looking at a minute, so a little bit slower than what you're saying, but not ridiculous either. Well, and that's, and I would say that's a safe average. You know, a lot of guys are going to get on Facebook. You know, like you said, it's they're going to get on Facebook, tell what they want to tell. But the God's honest truth is, most time, deer dogs are not looking at it. They're, I don't care. I mean, you do have your times where dogs are, are, are looking at it, trying to breathe the same oxygen. But most of the time, I'd say those dogs are probably the, uh, somewhere around that minute range behind, you know, 30 seconds to, you know, even a minute or two. Depends on what mm-hmm. the deer's doing and how it's running. You know, a big buck, that sucker's going to run a straight line. Big bucks run a straight line. They know, get the hell out of Dodge and let's get out of here. And they're going to they're gonna put it in the wind and go. So that makes it harder for a dog that, and not necessarily harder, but it's not as easy to keep up. I mean, you got to think they're twice as tall, as, you know, as, as a dog, as any walker. I don't care what kind of walker you have. They're twice as tall, so they're going to stretch out, and they're going to know how to stretch out. So those dogs are going to get behind a little bit. And that leads me to another question, which I know it doesn't affect our listeners, but it always it's always something that I – I think about. Mm-hmm. So when you run a big buck mm-hmm. out of a thousand acre block, mm-hmm. because you said he beelines, mm-hmm. how long does it take him to come back? How long before you see that deer again? Usually next day. Mm-hmm. At the most. Right. At the most. I mean, 
I've even we've even ran a buck in the morning before, like first chase, and the last chase we go back to that block and we ran that same buck. I so mean, he come he circles right back. Circles. They know where home's at. That's right. They know yeah. where home's at. I mean, you know, you always see a lot of your, you know, your your antis on there, and they're talking about, oh, they mm-hmm. drove the deer away, and you know, this and that. There's studies, and if you read Austin Tomlin's book, he's yep. got the <laughs> proof behind it, man. Like they even collar yeah. deer, and they're most. I think it was like a ninety something percent was back within like two days. Mm-hmm. Like that stat is just insane, you know. Uh, you know, and for my guys listening, you know, what is that? What is that on on bear? Do, do the bears straight line out of there, or you know, or are they more of a circle kind of thing? I don't like. I said I don't, I've never been, so I don't really know. It depends. Um, most, I mean, most if you're in their home range, which they have a pretty big home range, um, like you'll catch a juvenile boar mm-hmm. traveling to get to find somewhere. And now he may, he may be lined across two or three mountain ranges. Um, but most of the time they're, they're right back. Like, you know, and I'll just use training season cause that's a little easier mm-hmm. when the food, you know, the berries are on. I mean, you can drive down the, the one logging road today, strike a bear, run and tree it, come back tomorrow, strike the bear, run and tree it. Now, how many times do we tree the same bear? I don't know, but when you're striking in the same place, making the pretty much the same race and treeing in the same area, right. like you don't need like a rocket scientist to figure that out. Right. And it's the same size there. Like I'd love, I carry a cow tag. One of my buddies put a cow tag in my truck and he goes, he goes, I want you to climb up there and tag one of them so we can see how many times we tree. <laughs> it's literally, there's a green cow tag in my in the dash of my truck, but I haven't done that yet. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you better get it on video when you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they will. They'll laugh at me all the way. But, right. um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you treat, we treat a lot of the same bear. Um, so they're not leaving. Um, you know, like you said, they're not, you know, they're not leaving the area. That's their home range. They know every nook and crank, like they know they, this is where they live. So they're back. And like I said, it may be a couple of days, um, but they're back. And you got to think too, you know, deer and bear are both, territorial you know like you said they have their area and you know i know deer will fight over a certain area you know there's certain does that, that that's that's where he wants to be you know if we get a late rut and we're able to run during rut i mean my gosh that's now that's some fun running but even mm-hmm. even in the late season when bucks group together um and the reasoning behind that yeah that i don't know I, i'm not i'm not a i'm not that kind of person i don't know all the ins and outs and specs and why they do this at this time and that kind of thing but i do know late season the bucks are usually staying together i mean we'll run a pack of three or four bucks at a time sometimes mm. and 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 you can go back a day later and you can run those same three or four bucks out of there um but and i think that's just a a comfort like you said it's a comfort they know where they're at they know where home is they know where they're going to bed down i mean i I can take you in uh, several blocks and i can take you straight to where these deer are bedding down at i know 100 percent where they're where, where they're at so i mean and i think that's why they come back so hard is they this is their area this is what they're going to do this is where they're going to be this is home Mm -hmm. that's right i mean they spent their life their lifetime there <laughs> they, know, they know where the food's at they yeah. know where the bedding areas are at you know they know where the safe zones are at like that's it. The, yeah i mean why leave why would you leave that just because a dog's chasing me in circles for a couple of hours like mm, nah right. i'll be all right well and you gotta yeah. think too you know and I, I know a lot of the guys you know um on the field trial side like when we go to these pens and pleasure run especially if you go down to a, a, a coyote pen it mm-hmm. is the craziest thing I've ever seen. You know, some people are probably listening like, oh, coyotes in a, in a pen or foxes in a pen. That's, that's cruel. That's unusual. You know, blah, blah, blah. Look, I got a pen that I go to, and when I come through the gate, there's two of them sitting at the gate waiting, and they wait for you to drop the gate, and they and, and then they take off. It's a game to I them. Need to- I need to do some trash breaking down there. You need to say, <laughs> me up, man. I, I got two dogs. I need to, I need to test their patience a little bit. I, I never believed it until I saw it in person. And sure enough, man, you go to some of these pens and, and sure enough, you drive into the gate and you, and you take your light and scan. And there's th- two, three, you know, four coyotes sometimes just looking at you, just like, all right, drop them. And I mean, I've watched them like 
pitter back and forth, like, all right, here we go. We're getting exercise. We're going we're gonna to do this. And they just wait for the dogs, and it's a game to them. They love it. Hmm. Nice. So, so what's the difference? So you're running dogs and I, and I wrote this, I wrote me a little note here. So three of my dogs have quarter running dog in them. Mm-hmm. So I got them from Mike camp and, um, <clears throat> so they've got the running dog in them. Right. Uh, I, I really like the dogs. They're super fast. Um, I, I like a dog that can pick his head up and catch. Like that's my personal preference. Like, um, I don't particularly care for a dog that bobs his head and can't can't make up ground. Right. Um. Even though I own them, and I I'll probably still own them because that's why they call it a pack because right. you got to have five dogs to do one thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, unless somebody's breeding the perfect dog out there, and I'll I need to talk to you. But <laughs> right. um, they're you know they're super fast. Um, they're gamey. The little bit as they're when they're younger, they're a little bit weak on the tree. But after that year and a half mark, um, I mean, they're 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 great. They're great tree dogs. Um, and the thing that I do like, and I've had this happen several times throughout their their hunting experience, is if your dogs pull up slick, mine going on by it. Like they gonna go because they they that track. Um, so that's some, that's some positives or some things that I've seen in the, those dogs that I really like. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm not smart enough to know how to breed that back and forth and make it work. Um, I've heard a lot, I've asked a lot of people, I've got a lot of different opinions and I just don't have enough experience with it myself, but I do know that, like I said, three of mine have a quarter running walker in them and. I like them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're talking about if, if it's slick and they pull off real fast and that's something I've really noticed about the, the Foxhound, you know, the, the, the Foxhound walkers, you know, the the actual register one. I want to take a second and talk to y'all about Chestnut Mountain Feed Company, then Concord, Virginia. They are my go-to feed supply store. And if y'all are in the area or are even close to the area, y'all be sure to check these guys out. It is where I solely get my dog food from, my leashes and collars and stuff like that. And they also have some farm supplies as well if you're into that kind of thing. So y'all be sure to check these guys out. And like I said, in Concord, Virginia, and let them know that you were sent there by the Hounds Tales podcast and give them they have my seal of approval because they are the best feed store around and um, they really truly are a blessing to have so all right guys let's get back to the episode i think they're and i'm not calling these dogs stupid by any means but i think their attention span is a lot shorter than some of the tree stock you know tree stock dogs um and what i mm-hmm. mean by that is if And I don't know if it's a cold thing. I don't know if it's like a cold nose thing, or I don't know if it's a scenting. I don't know if it's a brain thing. But I've noticed that as well. Like, after a, so in our instance, after a deer is shot, my my tree stock dogs, my my true deer dogs, those dogs are going to stay right there. They're not going nowhere. They're not going out to go find something. They've got their reward. They're sitting there looking at it. You're petting them, and, and they're they're right there with you. You don't have to leash anything. You know, you, you know they're going to stay. Them foxhounds, you better put your hands on them because they're going to look at that thing. All right, that, that one's done. Let's go get another one. You know, they, they have no care about sitting there looking at it. They want to they, they want to chase. I think that the chase mm-hmm. is what thrives those that style dog. And I may be talking out of my butt here, but that's just my experience. Um, what I see out of the out of the foxhound breed is is that. Well, and it's funny you say that because I've you know with this pack of dog that I'm running now, um, and all of them, they, they all of them are pretty much the same. Uh, they they prefer the chase, mm-hmm. um, but once the you know if we if we ta- if we harvest a bear and take it out, they're not leaving. Right. But they could care less that it's that it's it's over. Right. Like they could care less. Like my dogs are not down there 
mauling and wooling and whatever you want to call it. Like, nah, they'll sniff on it. Yep, all right, we did our job, and they'll go on. And, you know, when people say that you've got to give your dogs game, you got to knock stuff out, you got to knock stuff out. Like, me now, with, you know, a couple years under my belt and getting long in the tooth, like, I realize so more that if you've got the right genetics, like, that is nothing more than a, um, un uneducated, um, statement. Right. You know, and I mean, yeah, you, you want to give your dog some game. Absolutely. I'm not saying that at all, but right. I'm saying that, you know, to, to have to give them everything that they catch or tree, mm, not hardly. Like my dogs are in for the chase. Like you said, yep. that chase is the game to them. Yep. Like it's the game and, and you know. And I think instincts pick up so much. Like, I, I think that's what you're, you know, you, that's kind of what you're talking. These dogs have such good, and some dogs don't, and some dogs don't. So <laughs> my, my deer pack, the, the, my, the, when I got back out of college, you know, long story short, I ended up getting some of my dad's old dogs that he used to have and, and brought it back home and, and bred to a dog that he had. And I know for a fact that the dog that I went and got, the, the male, that he used to have the 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 mom to that dog was a purebred registered tree and walker dog like a hundred percent tree and walker but mm -hmm. she wouldn't treat a coon she wouldn't treat a coon she wouldn't run a bear <clears throat> she had no interest in that but she would absolutely drive a deer absolutely mm. drive a deer and my dad ended up getting her i think for free if i'm not mistaken like the he knew a guy that worked with somebody or one of those kind of situations and the guy was like look you deer hunt this dog i cannot trash break it and she will not touch a coon that's what the guy was all about was coon hunting and he's like she mm -hmm. won't touch it and he uh gave it to her and that has been in my breeding program since because she was hmm. that good. So, I mean, that's where your instincts take over. You know, they tried and tried and tried, and I'm sure they knocked plenty of game out to her, you know, because mm -hmm. I think she was two when we got her. And, you know, I'm sure they did all kinds of the training that you do for coons, and no matter what, she wanted the deer. That's what she wanted. So that's where that instinct, and if you can breed that instinct and keep that instinct in them, man, you talk about making something dangerous. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's interesting. Um, it's very interesting to to see that because you know I've been I've been in the mindset on the front end of that, and I've like I said I'm kind of on the back end of it now. That you know if the, if the dogs are put together genetically correct, mm -hmm. um, just let them do their thing. Yeah, just let them do their thing. Yeah, and you know <laughs> you, you said something earlier. I, I was I was kind of a it was an interesting take. You know, you're talking about what uh, you know. It, do you put more? foxhound in them or do you take you know put more tree stock and or you know or, or bear dog into them and you know and that's something that i look for like um so my original pack i got one dog left uh, i call him vader that's that's my that's my boy he's been my a1 since day one dog I mean, he's been a life once in a lifetime deer hound and i bred him to keep his you know to keep his bloodline going I wanted something that was just a touch faster. So I actually bred him to one of my foxhounds. So mm. that's what I looked for is I picked that trait and I got a deer, you know, I got a foxhound that she's our, our brood jip, but she will, she, she loves a deer and she is fast, man. Like she has got a set of wheels. And, um, I bred her to her cause I knew that for one, she's got a good nose. So I'm not going to lose that nose but I knew she had the speed. Like, he was a fast dog. Don't get me wrong. He wasn't slow by any means. But I wanted something that was just a, a, a tick faster. And that's what mm -hmm. I went after, you know. And I think that's almost what, you know, that's the kind of the way I look at it is I figure out where I'm lacking. And then that's where mm -hmm. I go. That's what I attack. Yeah. Yeah. And and brings me to another question. <laughs> so, tell me about the noses because – um, that's something I'm struggling a little bit with coming from my old stock mm -hmm. that I used to hunt. And again, we have a better bear population. I don't need a dog to get down and, and cold trail for days. I, I don't need that, but that's what got me into hunting 
And that's what got me into the police canine world was the tracking part. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what, you know, the first time I ever had a dog, which was my old frosty dog. And, um, you know, set up on top of a ridge and listen to him trail down the holler and hit a, and, you know, hit a dry creek bed and he went down that creek bed and then he went back up another holler and up the uh, spine of a ridge. And, you know, he just, he was trailing. And I sat there and I'm like, um, you know, the reality kind of hit me is that he's telling a story. Mm-hmm. He's telling me everywhere this game went and that if I, if I did not hear him telling the story, I would have never known that that animal was there. Yep. And that's what's so great about hound hunting. Mm-hmm. And get, I, I don't mean to get excited there, but yeah. it gives me chills just remembering that that epiphany that I had sitting there on the side of the mountain that day, you know, thinking about this. But anyway, the nose. Mm-hmm. What like what kind of nose does your your foxhounds have? Okay, so the foxhounds. Um, and, and uh, this, uh, now you, now you're getting touchy because <laughs> <laughs> I personally speaking, I don't think the fox hounds have the nose that a tree stock dogs has. Um, mm-hmm. and now you may go talk to somebody that's, that has what we call like old Hellum stock. And I have a dog that has old Hellum stock. That's just. Uh, he was he, he actually just passed away here recently but a legend in the sport mostly white dogs and i mean he was absolutely dominant for decades and this was back though when you needed a nose heavy dog um mm-hmm. that, but that was when most of your field trials were on the outside too to now that now that we're mostly in pens, I mean, I'd say ninety five percent of your hunts, your field trials are ran in in the pens. To and, and like I said, you know, you ask, and this is just the way I see it. Too heavy of a nose in the fox pen will get you in trouble. Um, point wise, well, not necessarily point wise, scratch wise, like getting eliminated from the hunt. So there, uh-huh. there's rules in play, like a running a covered track. Um, th- there's um, uh, loafing. There's a failure to hark. Uh, not necessarily loafing. Loafing's not you know doesn't pertain to that. But the, the failure to hark, and pretty much what that is is by the rules. And I, I may be misquoting that just by a, a hair, but I, I'm pretty close to it. If if a dog hears a chase, if you're within, if that dog's within earshot of a chase, that dog is supposed to hark to it. That dog is supposed to quit what it's doing and go. But if you got a track heavy dog that has a good nose, like I got a dog that it took him a long time to get adjusted to his nose because he had a good nose and it was getting him in trouble. So he wasn't going to these chases. And by rule, you can't give a hunting score. Yeah, he may be hunting his tail off. But if he's in a spot where he can hear a chase, by rule, that dog is supposed to go. By, by, by the rules of field trialing, you're supposed to go to that chase. You're supposed to drop what you're doing, go get in the chase, and go compete. So by rule, that dog's not allowed to get a hunting score because he should be harking. You may not necessarily be able to track him, but I mean, uh, scratch him, excuse me. You may not be able to scratch him. Because he is still working, he is doing things that a hound is supposed to be doing, but he's not going to get scored. He's just wasting his time in the middle of that five-hour block. Um, and then you have covered track. I mean, then that's a whole other subject, but covered track is running over or hitting on and running a track that has already been ran over is pretty much what the, you know, the essence of that rule is. So if you've got a dog that has a really cold nose, in a fox pen, I mean, you got to think you're in, you know, a couple anything from a, a 50 acre fox pen to a, a 1800 acre fox pen, and if that dog runs over the same track a few minutes later that a, a pack just came through, the judge can 110 percent scratch that dog for undercover track. So that cold nose that that dog has, when in all reality, like me and you sitting here, like. Man, that's a good dog. He's got a cold nose. I love that. You know, I mean, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but you know, the, to me, when I first got into the pens, I was like, man, I love a cold nose because that's what I grew up on. That Vader dog mm-hmm. has one of the coldest noses, and like you said, it got me excited listening to you tell that story because I love mm-hmm. listening to that dog. I could take that dog in a block, and he'd just boo. 
boom, and then, you know, and it gets faster, and you get, and when the more it gets faster, you're like, oh, yeah, he's getting up on it now, and then all of a sudden he jumps, and he's, you know, getting after it. I, oh, my gosh, it just, that that's what excites me in the deer woods, but in the field trial world, man, that's, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You need, you got to find that perfect mix of having a dog that has a good enough nose to hunt, but not one that's going to get him in trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's a fine and I, line. And I'm, I'm seeing with these with these dogs, and I, I said it on a previous podcast. I feel like I'm walking over some tracks that I shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I can I can go find another bear, and my my male dog literally put his nose in some tracks this year, and went two or three hundred yards on them, and then turn around and come back mm-hmm. and. It makes me want to scratch my head. I'm like, dude, you can smell it, or you wouldn't have went 300 yards with it. Right. You know, like, go on the other 600 and jump it. <laughs> right. Um, so, it, it, I don't know. Like I said, in a, in a time or two, they they took a track without saying a word and ended up catching it in a hole. And like I said, they'll they'll rig they'll rig a track 400 yards off the road and go find it, wow. like or a, a a bear, yeah, yeah, not yeah. a track, but the bear odor right. itself. Um, I mean, they'll, they'll do that. And then you, you know, you just kind of scratch your head with like, and I think a lot of it, I, you know, I'm going to go back to the you know, conversation Jeff Shetler and I had on a podcast last year. It's all about the training. Um, I've not made the dog get down in trail. I've, I've pretty much, he's been on all of my, I mean, you know, they're on dog, they're on bear that's runnable because we have at this time and this time and date, we have a good population and I can, I can cover some more ground or drive around the side of another uh, mountain range and, and find one. Mm-hmm. Um, if it was like it was 20 years ago when we only caught five bear a year, like it'd be a different style of dog. Or if he couldn't do it, he wouldn't be eating my food because I needed something else. So I don't know. I was just, I'm curi- I was curious about that. Like, well, and I think you hit the nail on the head right there. I think it is a time change. I, and it's what we're expecting of the dogs. Um, and what I mean by that is, like you said, and with the bear population, it was the same way with the deer. You know, 30 years ago, you know, before yep. I was born, you know, yep. deer were scarce here. Mm-hmm. It, you probably ran a red fox or a gray fox here in Appomattox twice as much as you ran a deer. Twice as much. I remember my papa used to tell me stories that he would just sit in a block and just listen. Because, I mean, that's that's all they could run. They wouldn't shoot the fox because, I mean, why shoot it? That's what you're out there. That, that's what's there. That's what you can run. There's no point of shooting it. And he ain't hurt nothing. So, and a lot of yep. clubs are still like that. But we're, we're so heavily populated with deer now. And it sounds like, you know, bear are getting the same way. And we're getting in on our area. Bear are getting insane around our area now. You don't mm-hmm. have to hunt. So why does that dog need to hunt? Maybe that dog has gotten so used to saying, okay, I haven't gone 300 yards and I haven't picked up on a hotter track yet. And, you know, this track hasn't gotten any hotter. You know, forget this. I'm going to dump this and let's go, let's go wander and see if we can find a different hotter track. And I think that's mm-hmm. where a lot of these dogs are going, you know, and, and in the deer dog woods too, you know, a lot of our guys, you don't, you don't hear dogs trail very much. You send them in a block, you give them a few minutes, they'll, they'll bump, bump, bump. And then bam, a minute later they're Jump. running, you know, yep. it's uh, that Vader dog's one of the few in our hunting club that will take in just absolutely. Once he hits a scent, you can walk him 20 yards. If he hits a scent, he's not letting that scent go until he finds it. I don't care if it takes him yeah. an hour and a half to find it. He's going to find it, you know? And yeah. I think that's just where, I think that's, I think that's where the dogs have gone and it's not necessarily the hunter's fault. It's the population fault. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like I said, it's, you know, I'm not forcing him to, to do that. And I, I understand, I mean, I understand the, um, the ins and outs of it. And I understand that, like I said, population has a lot to do with it and my hunting style, like my hunting style has changed. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious on that because I, I asked the guy, and this this is one thing um, that I asked the uh, the guys with the Julys is they said they their dogs will tree. I believe they said it. you know they'll fall off a, a cornfield chase and and fall tree the edge of a cornfield on a coon in a heartbeat. Hmm. And I'm like, hmm, okay, you know it was very interesting because in my mind again we'll talk about perception. Yeah, is a running dog running dog like. 
they don't treat, but well, you got I've been proven well, not proven wrong, but I've been told that's a complete false. That's a false thing there. Well, you got to think too. A fox will tree. Yes, a lot of people don't fox, realize yeah. that a fox will tree. Yeah. I mean, we were we mm-hmm. were pleasure running last night, and I had the red light, and I watched the dogs coming through the edge of the edge of the woods, and they blew it up. And this one section, and I, I took and scanned the lights, and there was a fox had climbed the tree and just watched the dogs right up under them. A red or a gray? Uh, should have been gray. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah should have yeah. been gray. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. just, just they they tree. So I mean, maybe some of these yeah. dogs are getting used to these foxes treeing. I mean, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I guess yeah. it depends what That's they fine. get used to. Yeah, yeah. Well, James, we we're almost at an hour here. Let's, and I know we want to talk about something else before we um, we shut this down. Yeah. Um, so this week's been a very important week here in Virginia, and we're still not finished. Right. Um, you know, the legislation, the Senate Bill Seven Twelve got um, it was a tie vote, um, and our Lieutenant Governor, bless her heart, right. voted against it. Thank to thank the Lord. Um, and I know that. Uh, and this is one thing I want to put out here for the people that's listening. You know, these podcasts are recorded, you know, a week or two in advance, sometimes three weeks in advance. So when we put out information, we're giving you the information we have at that time. And sometimes we can't give you like the exact information on the day that it happens. So I apologize for that. But just for the structure of the podcast, like, you know, we've got to have stuff turned in and, and downloaded to the platform at a certain time and date. So, Makes it a little bit difficult, but we're still trying to do our best and give you the best information and the most updated. But sometimes we are a couple days out. So that happened on one of the podcasts and um, just want everybody to get that. But yeah, so 712 got voted down, a 2020 tie. Uh, Cree Deeds, Democrat, voted against it. Um, I have already sent an email to his uh, to him telling him thank you for, for voting no on that. Um and I want I don't want you to tell any names, mm-hmm. but I want you to tell the story what happened when you were on, at Richmond on the lobby day. So, you know, I was I was lucky enough to be able to take off of work and go to go to Richmond for the lobby day, like you said. And overall, I think it was a great experience. If nobody has ever done it before, I highly highly recommend. You know, I don't I'm sure other states do it too. You know, we're like you said we're at the beginning of this thing. We're both from Virginia, so. You know, I know in Virginia they do it. And if for anybody listening to, you know, I see a lot of things on Facebook that are like, oh, I didn't know that it was coming. I didn't know that Lobby Day was this. Lobby Day is the last Monday of January every year. And I didn't realize mm-hmm. that until this year, but that is it. So as a houndsman, if you, you know, especially because, I mean, this is a never-ending fight. If you want to yep. put your, your voice out there and go actually visit the people and see the people that are actually making the votes to make this stuff go through, put it on your calendar. Put it on, put it on for work. Go ahead and take it off. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's my little plug right there. But so <clears throat> uh, one of the main guys that are against dog hunting um, and it doesn't really make any sense because he doesn't even, I'm pretty sure he doesn't even have dog hunting in his area. I think we can just give his, we know that Marsden, Marsden wrote the bill. Yes, that's right. Marsden wrote the bill. Right. So, yeah. So, there was a big group in Marsden's office, and I was outside the office. I never got to hear it, you know, 100%, but I know for a fact that all of a sudden, I watched his hands go up and say, everybody out, close his door and lock the door. And no more, no more houndsmen were let in the rest of the day. What I was told that from the guys that come out that were in there was that somebody had spoke up and said, Marsden, how long have you been doing this? And he said, 15 years. And somebody spoke up and said, yeah, that's 15 years too long. That's from multiple people. That's, that's word for word, 100% right after it happened. That's what was said. Yeah, man, and and that just it ticked him. It ticked him off. I mean, and, and he was he was very, from my understanding, and I talked to several people that were in the room. He was very um, adamant that he wasn't changing his mind. And we kind of know, you know, he's been after this for a long time. You know, he's the reason that fox pens are not, you know, able to be built and are going to be shut down in you know thirty more years, whatever it is. But 
he had a, I mean, hell, he had a damn hat on his on his desk that said "End All Fox Hunting." So, I mean, we know where the guy stands. So, attacking the man is is not, and it just it, it ticked him off, and it absolutely gave nobody the chance to have a calm, cool, collective conversation and maybe explain some things, and who knows, maybe bring a new perspective to his light. You know, from. I mean, I, I was trying my best to get to everybody I could. And, you know, when I went, I wanted to speak to the guys that represented my area. That's where I attacked first, and that's where I went after. And I was lucky enough to be able to get in and talk to these guys one-on-one. But And then I started going towards Marsden, and then I got there as that happened. And, like I said, it, he shut the door, and not an orange hat was allowed in that room after that. Um, so, I mean, th- that – Man, that 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 was a big lose of the day, in my opinion. Yeah, we're we know we're not going to change. You know, he's very adamant where he stands. Like, right? I mean, he wrote the bill. This is, and he's telling you guys. But he was cordial enough to let you come in his office, and you said there were probably thirty people in there. Yeah, and at least um, speak. You know, speak on behalf of what you 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 did. And, you know, this is one thing, and I had this conversation today with a friend of mine. You know, I I mean, I live to hunt. Like, really. Like, I live to hunt. If I'm not at work, 98, well, I got to bring it back to about 90 because Maddie's keeping me busy. But, <laughs> like, um, if I'm not at work, I'm in the woods or on the water. Right. And that's what I do. I mean, that's what I love to do, and that's where I spend my time, and, and that's 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 my life. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I do not – I don't want them to change any law. That's where I stand. But I also understand that sometimes you have to compromise or you lose everything. Right. And I would rather, I would rather be a part of the solution than part of the problem. And – Um, you and I had this conversation that we, you know, us as hunters, we have to represent ourselves better and we get emotionally and I'm, I'm as guilty. I raise my hand right now. I'm guilty because it's, um, it's near and dear to me. Like it's, it is, I've done it my whole life and I, I plan on doing it as long as I can. And I want my children, I you know, I want my my kids to be able to enjoy the things that I enjoy. But I also know that going and attacking people verbally right. is not, is not going to help our cause. We need to be, we need to have legitimate arg- arguments for our behalf. We need to be well-spoken and we need to be articulate. You know, that's one thing in my profession that like when I write a report, I have to articulate exactly what happened and why it happened and what took place after it happened. Right. And that's something that I, sometimes I don't think we, that's something I think we can approve on. Yes. Yes. I, I agree a hundred percent, a hundred and ten percent. And, and like you said, you know, it's, it's so easy to get emotionally charged. And I think, I don't, I don't know Marston. I've never, never got to talk to the guy. I've never met him before, but I got a feeling that maybe that was kind of his ploy you know, and I could be talking out of my butt here, you know, but how easy was it for him to say, okay, I'm going to just keep egging these guys on and get somebody to blurt out something. And now we're the enemy. Now we're the bad guy. You know, we're under our scope, guys. We're, we're under a microscope. So every little thing, I mean, you talked about perspective earlier. And I mean, that's houndsman to houndsman, you know, not – not you know, and thinking uh, on uh, on you know having a, a different skew, you know a different view on the, on the no collar thing, and not you know and having that kind of you know, that my you know that different thought, you know for somebody that doesn't know dog hunting at all, think about how easy it would be to say that dog is not uh, that dog is abused and that dog is this and you know whatever, you know, without us being able to go in there and explain in a calm, collective manner 
why this is a bad idea, why this bill was a bad idea. Um, it just gave him more fuel for the fire is mm-hmm. all it did. I mean, look at the – I mean, I think it was amended twice by the time it finally reached final vote. Yes. Um, yeah, we we – a lot of people tried to push that last verbiage that was in there. Um, and even with the verbiage that a lot of us recommended, it still got voted down, you know, thank the Lord. Mm-hmm. But one thing that we all have to understand that this is, this ain't over. This is just mm-hmm. starting mm-hmm. and we've got to be prepared and organized. And like I said, we've got to come to, together as a community. Um, you know, all, all, all dog owners, because we all got lumped into this deer dogs, bird dogs, you know, duck dogs track, you know, blood tracking. We all got lumped into this and we're right. still working on, you know, the SB 30 and the HB 30. Yep. Um, you know, I seen some posts today about that and it, you know, it's got to go fi- through the appropriations committee, but, um, you know, we've all got to stay together and do, do more good than harm. And, and I'm not saying that, that with him didn't harm us because, you know, he's got his mind made up. But mm-hmm. if we're going to move forward as, as houndsmen, we have got to, we've got to do a better job um, articulating our why, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. our why, and, you know, why some of these laws are not, conduce that 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 bill was written poorly um it got some momentum and um i think that senator stewart was one of our saving graces from what i'm hearing mm-hmm. that he got behind closed doors with marsden and really tried to get some of that stuff changed because you know from from your from central virginia to where i'm at all i can't tell you the miles and miles of road that run through national force there's no private property nowhere in between right like you know, and, and I can't can't turn my dog loose there. Well, you know, put it on a lead and take it 15 foot. Mm-hmm. Um, we all know how well that'll work. But, <laughs> right. uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, you, you and I having that conversation and, you know, I, we're both on the same page. And, you know, you have you have an audience that you talk to and I have an audience that I talk to. And this is about coming together mm-hmm. and being better. That's it. Being better. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, and that, that was one thing that I've been super impressed with lately. And I don't think it's perfect by any means is that I remember, you know, five, 10 years ago where it seemed like if it was the bear hunters problem, it was the bear hunters problem. If it was the deer hunters problem, it was the deer hunters problem. You know, and <clears throat> I think that we're getting, I think we're getting better as far as uniting as one, as instead of considering ourselves bear hunters you know you're a bear hunter i'm, I'm a deer dog hunter I'm, I'm a foxhound guy you know i'm a squirrel guy you know i think we're all throwing away those titles and getting better about uniting as houndsmen but yeah. and and i think that works so good because like you said you know i don't hunt national forest i everything in our yeah. in our club is private land so that bill was going to affect a little bit but nothing crazy for me but listening to you talk about it that puts it in a whole different perspective i mean that would have really yeah. hurt you guys really hurt mm-hmm. you guys and i never would have thought that without communicating with people without you know talking mm-hmm. to you and listening and and understanding the different points because at first you know the the way it was originally wrote up the 712 i was like it's not that big of a deal you know, it's it's really not going to hurt it. In fact, it'd probably do a whole lot of better. But now, listening to you talk about how it's really going to hurt y'all in the national, you know, in in the for in the in the uh, state forest or whatever, you know, I'm like, oh gosh, man, we can't have that. We cannot have it. So, mm-hmm. and, and that puts a drive in me. Not not that I'm saying that I was ever like, yeah, go, you know, that's, this is this is our chance to to settle and and make the landowners happy. Um. But listening to you, you know, it's more like, okay, now I really have an understanding of why this cannot pass. Yeah. And I mean, I'm like, you know, just like the the guys down east, you know, it's going to affect them too because, you know, <clears throat> there are blocks that they hunt around and they've got permission on 1,200 acres and there's a 50-acre block that kind of sets adjacent or on the corner that, 
like you know, it it it, it was going to affect a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was not going the the law was not going to. It really wasn't going to solve the problem. Right. Um, it was just going to cause more problems for us as houndsmen, or not problems, but it was going to cause more more um hardship on us, I right. guess, on the way that we do things. We was going to have to change the way we do things. And, you know, everybody hates change. <laughs> and again, that goes back to what I said earlier. The only thing in life is that is a constant is change. Yeah. So we got to with that. But yeah, I mean, just, we got to do better. We got to be more articulate and make sure that we can explain our position, why it's important, what it does and doesn't affect. And, you know, just do a better job of that all the way around. Well, and, and something else with that, too, you know, if you do go to any of these lobby days or if you go to, you know, sit in on your board, you know, you know your DWR board meetings and stuff like that, and you do get the chance to speak, guys, remember, they do not care that it's your heritage. They don't care. They don't mm-hmm. care. They know that. They know. I mean, they, they I'm sure they, you know, everybody's going to have a soft spot for it. But they know that everybody knows it's your it's your heritage. They know George Washington did it. They know all these things that you're bringing to the table that are. This is why I want to do it. This is why I, you know. This is why I live for it. It's like you said, and you said it really nice. Like you got to explain why the the proposed bill is a negative. You have to make them understand that. You know, like you said, you know, uh, with 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 the um, with the right of way casting, this is why this is not going to work. You know, like the the SB thirty. You know, I can sit here and I, I explained this one to one of our guys, and I said, "Look, I was like, the way this thing is going to end up going with these dog permits and these, you know, these uh, dog hunter permits is it's going to end up like the Georgia rule." And I actually talked to a guy from Georgia that is, that hunts under those rules, and they have stickers in the back of their trucks, and it's got mm-hmm. a number on it. And that's what your you know your dog hunter identification number is. So if you turn dogs loose on Billy Bob's land that didn't like dog hunting, and he come out with a camera and recorded the dogs going across the land, and then went to the first truck he saw going past, and it was my truck, and I didn't do anything wrong. Now I'm getting the ticket, and they, there's no way to prove my innocence because you got it on camera that there's dogs turned loose, and now you got an empty dog box with a sticker, and that's that's who I saw, and all you have is the landowner's word. And the guy that I talked to, you know, he was like, "Man, I never thought about it like that." He's like, "Man, that that's that won't work, will it?" And I'm like, "No, it won't work. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's it's not a foolproof yeah. thing." And and I think that day, I'm not trying to make some kind of claim that I've changed somebody's mind, but I think it opened his eyes to where this can go and why this is not going to be a good idea. Yeah. 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 So, well, James, I appreciate you coming on and uh, we could talk for more hours, a lot more hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, this hours flew by. It feels like we've been talking for five minutes. I but, know uh, it. I know anything- it. Anything you want to leave us with, guys? And and this is and like I said, you know, this is good because we got two platforms going right here. If we don't, and like I said, I don't know a whole lot about the the bear hunting and the coon hunting guys. I don't know if they hunt as clubs and that kind of stuff. But guys, you know, we can preach bad seeds to these to DWR to these senators to these guys all the time. But if we don't start self policing. That's that's mm-hmm. a huge thing that I try to preach is we've got to self police. You know, I know you may have a buddy that turns his dogs loose because uh, a, a fourteen point buck with the twenty three inch spread just come through there, and God, we can't lose that track. Guys, we got to be smart, man. There's too there's mm-hmm. there's too many. No, you can't do it. You can't do it. And if you see somebody doing it, if they're in your club, I don't care if they've been your best friend since diapers. You need to either pull him to the side and say, you do it again, you're out, or you just need to go ahead and get rid of him. Because if we don't start self-policing, we're going to lose it. We can preach mm-hmm. self-policing and bad seeds all we want, but until we actually start acting on it, we're, it, it, we're, just, we're just peeing in the wind, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, and I've said that on several podcasts is, you know, we've got to, we've got to take care, care of that. We've got to, we've got to police ourselves and hopefully that'll correct a lot of the, and it's, it's, it's not the majority of people are trying to do right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people just get, you know, they get excited and do something like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. You know, problem fixed. Don't do it again. Problem right. fixed. But then you got people that are continuously, you know, skirting things and that's that's what's causing us the problem. So that's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> All right, James. I really appreciate it, man. Help me. thank you for helping us teach, train, and learn. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate you doing this uh dual dual podcast here. <laughs> and I hope everybody on my end enjoyed it as well. And thank you so much for uh for doing this, man. It's a great time. Absolutely, buddy.